Hello everybody, this is the Praetorian again. I'm back for uh, part two of the system we know according to timeline. Like I said before, I don't have it in blog form yet, but I will have it in blog form here eventually. Last time I was talking about Leon Bloom. In this uh, part of the series, I'm going to go on further and discuss other countries that were involved in Europe besides France and that there was a lot of things going on within your you, France through with Leon Bloom originally came out with the 40-hour work week they were consumed with socialist reform and Leon Bloom was actually the first socialist prime minister of France at the turn of the 20th century, France actually went from being a constitutional government to being a social go socialist government. So today, when you find yourself talking about France and thinking about independence and revolution and all of these discussions that are commonly done, you have to understand that is not France today. France was the beginning when it came to the socialist movement don't get me wrong I, I already know about the history of the Versailles peace accord and our president going over and pushing for the League of Nations that I do understand but like I said there's parts within history concerning socialism and concerning the world that aren't being told and that's what I'm trying to keep focus on here so that my story shows you what history books don't show you now if you go to college and you get a degree you'll learn about this stuff if you actually take time to keep up on your history most college students give up on history though after high school and that that is a fact the majority of people really don't understand what's going on in the world today because they don't actually take history when they go into college. Now I'm going to talk about the Treaty of Saint Germain and the countries that that were also involved in the socialist movement. No. The Treaty of Saint Germain concluded the First World War signed by Austria on one side and the Allied powers on the other side in 1919. The treaty officially registered the breakup of the Habsburg Empire. It also recognized the independence of Czechoslovakia, Poland, and Hungary, the Kingdom of the Serbs, Croats, and Slovenes, Yugoslavia. Seating Eastern Gallica, Trent, Trento, Southern Tyrol, Feast, and Ashna. The Covenant of the League of Nations was integrated into the treaty. A firm rejection of any union between Austria and Germany without the consent of the Council of the League of Nations was added. The military clauses limited Austria's military to 30,000 men and broke the Austria-Hungarian navy, distributing it to the Allies. Though Austria was made liable for reparations, no money was actually ever paid. Austrian officials protested the principle of self-determination in the treaty. The placement of so many ethnic Germans under Czechoslovakian and Italian rule and forbidden to unify with, the, with Germany. Thomas Masaryk was the chief founder and first president of Czechoslovakia in 1918. He was a Neo-Kantian but was also strongly influenced by English Puritan ethics and the teachings of the Hussites. Musarek also took an interest in pointing out the self-contradictions of capitalism too. Or, though he wished to remind the Czechs of the religious 
meaning of their heritage, he also criticized Czech politicians and their belief in Pan-Slavism. He was against Pan-Slavism so much he exposed a medieval patriotic Czech poem as a forgery. He was against not only Pan-Slavism, he criticized the Hungarian sovereignty too and promoted equality. In 1898, Masaryk began to discuss imminent contradictions between capitalism and socialism. In 1913, he described Russia's religious intellectuals and its society as a whole, describing it as a Byzantine retardation of the Russians by the Orthodox Church combined with reactionary ideas. Slowly, Tomas Masaryk became estranged from his old con conservative beliefs. Eventually, he joined the liberal Orgus Young Czech Party. In 1891, Masaryk was elected to the Austrian Reichstrad. After disagreeing with the Young Czech's party's emotional nationalism, he resigned from his office and formed his own realist party. In both the Reichstrat and the standing committee of the Austrian-Hungarian parliament, Masaryk attacked Austria-Hungary's alliance with Germany. He was against German imperialist politics concerning the Balkans and defended Serb and Croats' right. So right here you have a clear sign of a socialist working within Czechoslovakia. What you have here first off is the Treaty of Saint Germain. It concluded the First World War and it was signed by uh, both Austria and the Allied Powers in 1919. It also broke up the Habsburg Empire. Now the Habsburg Empire within and you had called the Order of the Golden Fleece. Now in two parts of the Order of the Golden Fleece you had one that was or it's the Habsburgs, Habsburgs which was in you know Hungary and Germany and areas like that and then you had another half which was down in Spain and these two orders within within the uh, Holy Ro Roman Empire they had a lot of money now this money came up missing you know the last emperor of Germany was involved in World War One and like I said in, in, in my first series the Warburgs were working with him Max Warburg was actually an advisor and he orchestrated a lot of uh, deals between him and his brother as well to help out with their family bank and then he was you know advising military politicians as well as the Emperor of Germany while they were engaging in chemical warfare. <clears throat> After the war with the Treaty of Saint Germain, the Habsburg Empire was dissolved. It, it no longer existed. During this time period there was a lot of revolution going on. Everybody that was within the Axis, if you look at them, they were major players in the Holy Roman Empire and they believed in imperialism. And then you have the Allies which were turning towards socialist reforms and that was taking the place of constitutional government which was actually formed way way before this by John Locke out of England mostly a lot of people didn't like the, the or the theory of constitutional government because it consists of con contractual theory today people talk about contractual theory and the first thing that pops in people's minds are this our straw man 
fallacies and stuff like that, and that's just not the case. It's actual fact. I mean, that that's what constitutional governments run off of is a contract, and uh, that wasn't enough. So what they wanted to do is they wanted to create socialist programs that would dictate this or dictate that and dictate this and it's like with the Bill of Rights our founding fathers in the United States said they don't agree with uh, with uh, the Bill of Rights for one reason and that's because it gives the impression that those are the only rights that the citizen has and I can understand the effects because of today, the way people act, okay? You think that these Bill of Rights and these amendments are the only rights that you have, but they're not, okay? You have God-given rights, which I'm not going to get into the debate about God. It's just under their description of what they thought God was, those were the rights that you were given. Okay, you had a right to breathe, you had a right to eat, you had a right to be free, be happy. You know, that's what they were talking about. I do agree with the Bill of Rights when it comes to certain aspects, but I do look at the other side of the coin and understand that because a lot of people have fallen into that misconception. Thomas Masary was the first president of the Czechoslovakia in... Now, see, he gets caught up in in uh, pointing out uh, self-contradictions in capitalism. And that's one thing that you see a lot of when it comes to people who practice socialism. They want to criticize capitalism. And that right there is a form of subversion. They, they practice subversion. Self-contradictions contradictions in capitalism is one of them when you hear that just call it out like it is say look you're just preaching your socialist bullshit and that's all you're doing you know I, I see it every time I, I can hear it when atheists talk when they start using socialist terms they hide behind atheism and other groups to spill out their socialist rhetoric they actually have a book for socialism if you go and check out the new school in New York, you'll find it. Now, Pan-Slavism, that's where it starts getting all murky and uh, real cr crazy because you have Pan-Slavism and then you have Pan-Russianism. There was like old patriotic poems and old patriotic stories that the Czechs really believed in and it was a part of their heritage. and he would literally go and he would try to find them and find out which ones were for forgeries and which ones weren't real and he would point them out all right that's another form of subversion S socialists do that today they want to pinpoint in history what is factual and what isn't factual and tell you that you know absolutely nothing because that's not fact this is what actually took place and the reason why they want to do that is because they want to subvert the values and the ideas that that area has um, everybody thinks the word equality means you know something good it's something that you should stand up but nobody really does the research behind what these people do in the, what they use equality for is they they attack country's sovereignty you me and everybody in this country as citizens we are the sovereignty we represent the sovereignty of the United States and these people literally attack you and me and every single person in this country in order to promote equality because see you and me, we have different opinions. We don't think alike. We are different. And this is an obstacle to socialists because socialists want to do things easier. And in order to do things easier, me and your opinion has to go. We, we can't be a part of the discussion.